I'm very glad that I can share this very important panel on elections during the COVID-19. It's a topic that has um, accompanied us during the last two and a half years and um, also especially with International ID and also the Electoral Integrity Project. There were already many case studies with a kind of descriptive nature, historical perspective, but also some um, case analysis um, published. So I think it's very great to build on what has already been done and to have this very diverse panel this um, evening or depends on where you are in the world, maybe it's also your morning or afternoon. Um, we have four papers today. Um, the first paper starts with an overall overview of elections and the COVID-19 and provides a general perspective also as regards to the um, impact on the electoral integrity and um, shows whether it impacts actually um, the electoral integrity and whether there's some um, electoral integrity resilience. After that, we do have time to go into case studies. One is about Portugal and the other one is about Argentina. And then we conclude with one presentation about building integrity, um, the impact of the COVID-19 on electoral training. Each of the presentations will have 15 minutes. I make it in the way that I switch off my screen and after 12 minutes, you will see me popping up again and then you know, okay, it's kind of time to find your concluding remarks. Um, we have then some around 10 to 15 minutes for um, in the discussion um, that will be done by Amanda. And then there's enough time for the Q&A session as well. So I would say, um, let's start with the first paper and I welcome Toby and Holly Ann. So looking forward. Brilliant, thank you so much, Rebecca. Uh, and thank you everyone for, for coming along. It's great to see so many uh, familiar faces in, in the room uh, and faces also very much kind of contributed to uh, the project that um, I'm going to kind of introduce. Um, and so obviously COVID-19 uh, was, you know, one of the biggest challenges, you know, the world's faced in many respects and has many uh, kind of tragic humanitarian consequences. Um, but there's obviously an important, despite those, it's important to look at the consequences that there have been in terms of elections um, and how some of the possible adverse effects that could occur um, have been mitigated uh, or whether they have been mitigated. And so the Electrical Integrity Project um, uh, um, combines with International IDEA uh, and the UK um, Research Council to investigate this um, kind of challenge, um, looking at A, what have the effects been of the pandemic on electoral integrity, what can be done to mitigate these possible effects, uh, and which of those policies actually work, and perhaps some may have some adverse effects. And so what we did was to commission a range of case studies throughout um, 2020 and 2021. Um, and these will be very familiar to some of you. Um, it's a little bit of a world tour. We ended up, I think, with 22 um, cases um, in total. Um, unfortunately, as project coordinators, we didn't get the chance to, to get to any of these places, which is very, very sad. Um, maybe at some point in the future. Did get to go to this place though. This is this is my polling station, which, which is just down the road. Um, you know, we're aiming to try to make this particular polling station very famous. Um, so 22 cases overall. Um, but what we also did was to look at collecting some survey data. Um, some of this was to undertake a, a polling survey in the UK um, with Alastair Clark. Um, and we've bringing this together into a volume which is going to come out later in this year, along with some kind of thematic analysis. But what the Talking Integrity Project also did was to include some questions in the, um, in the perceptions of electoral integrity uh, survey, which has gone out over the last year or so, looking at what uh, the effects were in, in different countries. And that's really what the, the paper focuses on here, uh, which is from myself, um, but also Holly uh, and Alistair. And so I'll begin just by saying a little bit about, about the literature on pandemic effects. Secondly, um, kind of introduce some of our kind of conceptual frameworks, um, how we kind of tend to view electoral integrity uh, and some of the theoretical expectations um, that we have uh, before we go on to look at some of the, the data and design 
and some of the results that have come from this. And I should say, this is our kind of first iteration of the paper, very much at the stage where we kind of welcome comments and feedback, um, and uh, the results are as a, um, kind of provisional in nature. So in terms of pandemic effects then, um, the literature on this has grown quite quickly. There's a very limited literature on how countries deal with um, emergency situations uh, at around election time prior to the pandemic. There were occasional studies perhaps looking at um, the, you know, what the effects of Ebola were, what the effects of SARS were, but generally speaking, um, studies were few and far uh, between, um, maybe focusing on the effects of, 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 fl of floods, for example. But quickly during the pandemic, um, scholars had turned attention to this. The initial focus was potentially on the, the role of postponement. Lots of elections seem to be postponed. Was this a good thing? Uh, was this a bad thing uh, for democracy and electoral integrity? We then saw many of these kind of historical kind of case studies uh, kind of springing up, which obviously uh, we've kind of contributed to. There's a very strong US literature focusing on the US case. Um, obviously, the, the presidential election of 2020 was uh, hugely significant for America, but also hugely significant internationally. And then we have seen come some studies looking at um, some particular aspects of, of elections. So, for example, what were the effects on turnout or uh, women's candidacy? Um, and obviously, importantly as well, um, was it the case that holding an election during a pandemic would actually cause the spread um, of uh, the disease or, or not? But still relatively little um, kind of crash cross national analysis. And this is where we try to uh, kind of contribute. And so the framework that we use to try to uh, define and conceptualize lecture integrity uh, is as follows. What we what we look to are to, to kind of democratic norms. And we ask the question, well, to what extent do elections uh, adhere to principles uh, which in turn bring about um, democracy. And uh, these are kind of the, the five kind of core principles um, that um, we point to. First of all, elections should allow opportunities for deliberation. So on, uh, on a very basic level, everyone should be able to vote and take part and information should be free and available for them to do so. But maybe also uh, with greater aspirations, we want uh, democracies to be more deliberative in nature as well. Equality of contestation, insofar as um, elections are at their best when everyone participates. But if it's the case that not everyone participates, are those um, kind of democracy deserts kind of even across the population? Or instead, is it the case that some segments of the population are more likely to vote and maybe more likely as a consequence to get political representation as a consequence? Um, Secondly, sorry, thirdly, equality of a contestation. So is it a level playing field for all kind of candidates and parties? Does everyone have an equal chance to take part in the election? Or perhaps are some candidates or parties um, advantaged or disadvantaged in, in the electoral process? And of course, elections often do have some of those hurdles in terms of money and so on. Um, but this obviously was potentially a problematic issue um, for, the, for the election. Fourthly, electoral management delivery. So do the elections run smoothly? Uh, do citizens uh, receive and, and can they expect a high quality kind of service, if you like? Do, is there a good public service in the way that we uh, would expect from schools and, and hospitals? Um, and lastly, what became particularly important during the pandemic was, was there kind of certainty about the rules of the game? Were we in a situation where actually the rules of the game were, were being changed at the last minute? Actually, it became difficult for administrators to run the election, but also for parties to prepare um, to compete in this contest. So there was obviously a big expectation that um, the pandemic would have a major effect on electoral uh, integrity in, in, in a number of ways. Um, so we introduce um, the idea really of, of electoral integrity resilience in the paper. I know elect democratic resilience is something that's been used already in the literature um, on electoral backsliding, so on democratic backsliding, um, where it's been kind of conceptualized as a, as a two-step process. So you may see some initial backsliding, but perhaps some democracies having seen that are then able to resist uh, the process. But what we're looking at here in this case is what we define as um, the configuration of societal actors, resources and properties which enable a country to adapt to an external shock which could 
damage electoral integrity. And outside of electoral studies, outside of, kind of studies on democratization, there's that broader literature, either from business studies or uh, positive psychology, which looks at how either an individual or an organization can respond to these, um, to these potential problems. And so what we think um, this kind of electoral integrity resilience resources could come exist of, for example, would be things like the possible constitutional structures, although we don't look at that in this paper. Um, the strength of democracy could play a particular role in the economic resources, electoral um, organizational structures, and also um, kind of voting procedures. And these, this provides the kind of context in which different actors um, play out in, in, in politics. So it's not kind of completely determined um, by the kind of um, contextual situation, but these could be um, important factors nonetheless. So in terms of the expectations, what we think might happen, therefore, what we thought might have kind of played out uh, was, first of all, that there would have been an impact um, of the pandemic on electoral integrity. Um, time would make a difference. So maybe there'd be an impact at the start, but over time, countries would have the chance to respond and learn to um, other experiences. They maybe hopefully even, even see our case studies and say, oh, hang on, South Korea did this, so we need to make sure that's in, that's in, in place. And countries obviously have more time to prepare um, for this situation. And presumably the levels of cases would make a difference. So, you know, th there's lots of peaks and troughs in the pandemic, which is still continuing. So we would expect this to kind of play a role there as well. But then you have these resilience components, these, these properties of, of, of states that might help them to, to respond. So a level of democracy, we think, obviously would make sense to be important because you know, um, decision makers are more likely to be held to account for any problems um, that may occur during the electoral process. There'd be the higher expectations for them to um, play by the rules of the game. Economic resources should be really important because they're required, um, and the literature shows they're required, um, countries that are kind of economically more prosperous tend to hold better elections, but they would obviously have the resources to, to draw from in a pandemic situation. Then the organizational situation, organizational situation should be important too. EMBs that have more capacity or more independence, you'd expect them to be able to perhaps uh, maneuver themselves uh, more freely to ensure that elections are better run. And maybe countries that have special voting arrangements, um, a greater diversity of, of voting methods. So not just um, in-person voting, but also postal voting, uh, early voting and so on. That would enable um, greater resilience because if you have a pandemic on election day, there's other ways in which people can kind of cast cast their votes. So to say the methods that we look at here, um, what we've been running is a special battery of, of questions during um, for the perceptions of electoral integrity surveys. Um, the data that we're drawing from here is from two years from elections in 2020, 2021. Uh, so there's we're going to run this for 2022 as well, at which point the data will kind of be published as part of the, um, um, the overall PI kind of data. It's obviously an expert survey, as many of you will know, which is asking experts' perceptions of election quality. Uh, and what we've got here is 89 countries um, being in included. And we're running this with um, a variety of other data on EMB capacity, independence, number of cases here as well. So those are the questions um, that possibly many of you have completed and had to respond to in, in, in the survey. But the idea here is that they match up to these components of electoral integrity that are introduced earlier in uh, the paper. So they, uh, the aim is to measure um, in some way these um, different components. So in terms of results, and as I say, it's still relatively, you know, this is our first kind of presentation of this. At the aggregate level, there doesn't seem to have been that much of a dip in terms of electoral integrity. So this is the, the overall PEI index, and it goes up and it goes down in, in, in different years. And obviously, the pandemic kind of hit in 2020, going into um, 2021 there as well. There is a bit of a dip in 2020, it, it, it rebounds, but that wasn't thought to be statistically significant. Um, but then looking at some of the components, um, this is there's a Likert scale is used for the questions, as you may, as you may know, a high um, number on that scale, five, is indicating that people agree that there was a, um, a problem, um, low, low responses suggesting that people kind of disagree. So a value of around three is a kind of neutral response. And overall, 
it, it seems to be um, kind of relatively neutral. And it's the, it's the campaign, the opportunity for, for deliberation that is most affected, whereas kind of rural institutionalization um, postponement was, was less of an issue. But as you begin to look at um, kind of different kind of countries, um, different kind of cases, um, you do see quite a lot of kind of variation um, going on here. So, um, you know, although overall, um, there, there might not be a major uh, effect. There's lots of countries where this was a major effect. So you can see, uh, you know, Mali, for example, uh, at the top there, respondents showing that that was um, very strongly affected by the pandemic, Syria, Ethiopia, Zambia, Belarus, um, and, and, and so on. And the next few figures just show these components over time. So opportunities for deliberation, again, again you see a spread. Um, of how affected they are. Montenegro, very strongly affected. Slovakia, much less affected. Um, there is a correlation between time and how much these are affected, but it tends to be quite low. You can see the quadratics um, is, you know, having a relatively low R squared uh, value for these. Um, and I could just sit and stare at those figures all day long because they're kind of quite fascinated by one, by why some countries are in the position that they are. But what we do then in, in the paper is to run some regression models to say, well, okay, everything is maybe, you know, some countries are affected much more than others. What are the key factors that are affecting the extent to which they are affected? In other words, to what extent are these resilience resources actually playing a really important role? And the regressions with all the stars and all the detail is available um, on the EIP website for you to look at and for comments kind of very kind of um, encouraged and very welcome here. But you can see the extent here as a way of a bit of a summary, what seems to come through. COVID cases or the number of cases um, seem to have a small effect. It wasn't statistically significant. The day since the pandemic um, was declared, that did play a role, but it seems to be quite quite small. What does seem to be very important are those two in the middle, that the extent to which a country um, is a democracy and, to, and the extent to which it is well resourced. So those seem to be the two um, main things that, that were coming through uh, our factors. And the other thing we looked at as part of the study was also, what, well, to what extent does this uh, play a role in um, affecting people's participation in the pandemic? There's lots of concerns, for example, that people will be less likely to vote uh, because they might catch COVID down the polls. So perhaps this would repress political participation. And again, the figure here shows you a summary of some of the um, regression um, LLS models. Um, lots of things here which we might expect to have a role um, didn't have so much of a role. Um, level of liberal democracy was, was important. Um, Notably at the bottom there, special voting arrangements was important. It found a positive, but often not statistically significant um, answer in, the, in, in, those, um, in those models. So bringing it together, um, we're living obviously through, um, you know, for a pandemic, a very, very unpredicted event, but arguably we may see many more, uh, you know, unpredictable events in the future. Things like floods, things like um, snowstorms, which I know one of the, one of the uh, members of the audience is currently kind of experiencing climate change will bring these unexpected events. And so there is this challenge of how democracies and how countries re uh, respond to this. The study here seems to show that it was the campaign that was most affected. Um, there was some, some evidence of a, of a declining effect over time. Uh, people learned how to respond to this, but it was in particular um, the um, level of um, economic resources and the level of democracy that were particularly important. And so I guess for policymakers, that really poses the question, um, how do we help those particular states in the future? What policies do we have to have in place? Special voting arrangements might be one obvious option. The models here show some evidence that that has a positive effect, but obviously is not the, the whole story. And there's other things that are gonna be important too. So thanks ever so much for, for, for listening. Yes, thank you very much Toby, for this great presentation and a very good uh, start into our discussion this evening. Um, I forgot to mention also for all those uh, who are listening um, to this uh, panel, uh, if you have any comments, you can also, while people are presenting directly, directly wrote something in the chat and address 
uh, the persons and of course like our channel atmosphere sh should be constructive and um, any kind of comments are welcome that will help then the presenters. So with this, I would like to continue with the second case and that would be um, a paper presented by Carla about a case study um, on Portugal. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here uh, in this project and in this panel in particular. <clears throat> and just to make clear, um, or, or, or just starting my, my presentation, um, I was indeed one of the authors of the, the, the case studies that were uh, carried by the IP and, uh, and the international ideas. So I wrote a case study on Portugal. And actually, the, the, what I'm presenting today is quite an, an attempt to, to start from and to use this case study and the data that I gathered um, to move uh, a bit forward. So classical question, can you see my presentation, my slides? I think it's okay, yes. thank you so much. Okay, so I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a researcher at the Center for Social Studies and I coordinate this project vote, vote the HR elections, democracy and human rights. And um, I've been working with uh, electoral officials in, in Portugal. And this explains a bit my, my knowledge, my interest, and I think the, the, the relevance of, of these questions. Um, and so <clears throat> when I was researching, and, and it's interesting because a few days ago there was, a, there was also a presentation here on electoral management, although um, it's not always the case. Why study electoral management? <clears throat> and so this combination, when going back to the theoretical basis, and of course there are some authors in the in the room, which is which is great, um, to see electoral management that is a determinant of electoral integrity, and also there's one expression that I really like to, to see electoral management as a government a governance network that delivers elections, and also if we go further into analyzing electoral uh, management, we can see that the implementation uh, at the grassroots level uh, can be different from what was envisaged uh, in, the, in, the, in the law. Um, so there's a great power of the, the people that is implementing um, the election uh, and especially in, in challenging times. So why study this? Why study this area? Um, I think that the, the first paper was, was great to provide uh, even more context to this. Um, the pandemic brought very strong challenges to electoral management. And in the case of Portugal, as I'm going to show, uh, and also going back to the broader framework, it brought the challenges to these networks of several institutions delivering elections. And some of my conclusions, and this is something I'm still working on, it, are that the the facto power or the way that the electoral administration is envisaged and is designed in the law is not exactly what happens on the ground and this is this has strong consequences and that, so i think there's a mismatch here in the way that the electoral administration and the electoral management and the electoral management models are conceived and maybe it's time to try to go beyond the classic uh, models uh, of electoral administration. And also, as Toby was, was showing, results of this research can be expandable to other contexts, context, so we never thought we'd have a, a pandemic. Um, but it's, it was a strong test to these networks, and they can be replicable uh, as elsewhere. And of course, the way to study this is to have empirical studies addressing electoral workers, and this is something that I've been doing. So within my project and after the, um, the close work uh, with electoral officials and electoral workers, I, I think I prefer this broader expression, electoral workers, uh, because I think the problem sometimes is to have fixed categories or at least while we're addressing these issues. Um, uh, this close work with the uh, electoral workers provided um, very rich data that I, um, I'm using. I've used it in the in the case study for <clears throat> the the DIP, and also try to look at this data and try to build uh, from it. So my questions or some of my questions that I, I think it's worth looking at 
it's who are uh, these, who is inside these electoral governance networks. And I think there's already <clears throat> a shift here, or there might be a shift here, because instead of looking at the electoral management bodies and also the classic version that we all know the, of the three models of electoral management, to think of this as networks, as, as institutions that intertwine, that relate with each other, and also, and already giving uh, a bit of my conclusions, some sense of there should be more openness and more dialogue with civil society society and other institutions. And I think this was one of the things that were missing, uh, especially in this case in, in, in Portugal. And then to look at this as a stress test, what happened? And at the end, um, I could say also using expression, who saved the day? And for instance, in the case of Portugal, my strong belief that who saved the day they were uh, electoral officials on the ground and outside the, the bodies of the classic structure of uh, the electoral administration. So here the research question, who in fact runs the election? So I think it would be very, um, very important to look at this, to see what worked, what did not work, but most of all, to look at who in fact was implementing the elections. And I think it's very curious and in these conclusions that the most prominent role uh, was played by institutions that are not considered as part of the electoral uh, administration. Um, so there's, there isn't much written on electoral administration on this new conceptualization. Of course, there are some literature from Caroline, a great friend as well. Um, and also addressing again the performance of electoral functions. So there's not, um, there's this more uh, loose and this, and this definition uh, regarding who does what and not a fixed and theoretical category. Uh, and of course, uh, a strong in, the importance of having a, a strong empirical uh, research. Um, and of course, the pandemic brought uh, very good conditions to uh, study this. So regarding the methods that I use, and uh, as I already told you, uh, I use my work with the electoral stakeholders at multiple levels, uh, focus groups, the training and the feedback that I received. So it, it was a pretty much uh, kind of a bottom up um, uh, gathering of, of knowledge uh, in this regard. And I think that it, it makes it quite, uh, quite unique. So here you have just going back to the classics, classics the, the basic, the, the three um, electoral management or administration models. So the classic ones, independent, governmental and mixed. And so Portugal would be in the mixed. And so why Portugal? It's not just because I'm based in Portugal. I think it makes a really good case to study this. First of all, because the uh, electoral administration, I think it's a bit beyond the mixed model. There are several institutions performing uh, electoral management functions. So you have the National Electoral Commission, which oversees the process. You have the Ministry of Internal Affairs, Affairs who in theory implements the process. Um, and I'm saying in theory, because both of these institutions, these two institutions, they are centrally located and they do not have a local network. So what they do, and mostly the Ministry of Internal Affairs, they coordinate with local authorities. So these are the 308 municipalities and more than 3000 civil parishes. But then one originality is that you have polling stations. They are uh, considered bodies of electoral uh, management on election day and also the poll workers. So what I'm looking at is trying to looking at who are the people running the elections, who is doing what and who uh, in fact is taking the decisions. So again, why Portugal? So we look at, if we look at the PEI, we see there's, there isn't much going on, has strong indexes of electoral integrity, trust on the electoral authorities. So let's say there are no issues with the electoral authorities. Um, and also during the pandemic, I think we had almost all elections that we could have had. So these are the elections that we had, we had the local referendum. And of course, thinking about timely preparations um, let's say that we would have an election in January 2021, so the pandemic starts in March 2020, but we just had the first law in November 2020, so it took almost a year uh, to pass a law addressing these, uh, these issues. So then we had local elections, which are the most challenging, and also on top of it all, parliamentary snap elections, so everything happened, everything that 
we never thought happened during this uh, this this period. So to to cut it short, and there's more detail on the on the paper. Uh, the Portuguese strategy they based on two very precise things, uh, and there's also a lot that could be said on this. The expansion on early vote, the reduction of voters per polling station, and this of course led to a higher demand for polling places, a higher demand for poll workers, and a higher demand in general of people who working uh, in the elections. It happens to be that all that these two in particular, they are implemented by the municipalities. So actually the burden, so to say, or the work of implementing the elections during COVID was left to the municipalities. Uh, we have câmaras municipais, juntas de freguesia, so this could be translated as municipalities and civil parishes, and of course, poll workers. And so also to give you a sense of the challenge, these are the, the figures of elections before uh, the pandemic. So we have here the figures, the figures of people needed to work on, on the election uh, and also how uh, it has risen. Um, and another thing that is missing here, and I really hope I can do this in the, in the near future, is because this is for poll workers, but there's a figure missing here, which is the number of people in municipalities who is actually working on the elections. And also the question of who are these people, because they are somehow the missing link or the missing ones here. Uh, and again, I think that's using a, a paper from Toby and Alistair. I really like this expression, the unsung heroes of electoral democracy. So this refers to poll workers, but I think in the case of Portugal, that the unsung heroes of electoral democracy are at most the, the people working in the municipalities that happen to be outside um, this scheme and this more traditional uh, approach to electoral administration. So when it comes to studying electoral administration and also going back to, to the, the first model, the classic model, I think that there's something missing here, which is looking at electoral administration, uh, starting from addressing who is implementing elections on the ground. In the case of Portugal, this would be municipalities, civil parishes, polling stations and poll workers, but there's no account for electoral workers. Uh, in the case of Portugal, as municipalities, they have a lot of autonomy as foreseen in the law. Uh, they do not have a uniform organic insertion, insertion. So some people working with elections, they work with electoral um, bodies uh, already. There are no dedicated teams. They are civil servants and they are responsible for other areas as well. Um, and also the level of expertise is very, very, very uneven. So there are municipalities that can afford to have large teams that are well-trained. In some of them, it's just one person that likes training or has learned uh, on the job. But most of all, and I think this is one of the most important parts, they are formally absent from the decision-making process, I would say formally, but they are in fact the ones taking decisions on the ground. And I think that there are two cases and I use the, those in the paper which is the early vote from care homes, uh, the use of protective, so three, use of protective masks and the appointment of, of polling staff, where there was no guidelines from the central administration uh, and these decisions were taken by municipalities. So this makes a clearly uneven implementation of the election on the ground, meaning that the solutions will be different uh, throughout the country, which is something that was not intended. And especially in the early vote for care homes, this allowed uh, the decisions taken, taken allowed to create something that was not foreseen in the law. And it was very clear that there was space for, for this. Um, so I think these electoral workers, um, they need to be taken into consideration. And of course they belong to municipalities which are not formally included uh, in the electoral administration model. But I think that there should be another way to address uh, these models of electoral administration, uh, the part of starting from who uh, is uh, running the, the election. So in my final minutes or final minutes, uh, so also to say this, this would also allow um, to overcome this missed opportunity for participation and openness in the, in the process. For instance, there were issues with the recruitment of poll workers from civil society, 
Um, and this also looking at electoral administration, starting from who is doing what or who is actually doing um, this, performing these functions, would also allow to open to other people um, that could have a, a role on this. Um, so very briefly and going to uh, my conclusions, so what I'm trying to grasp here is the parting, uh, starting from the case of Portugal, which is very rich uh, on how it's um, defining also the, the multiple institutions uh, performing uh, the electoral administration um, and to um, use or to go beyond the electoral administration classic model. So um, proposing to correct, mapping who takes, who is in fact taking the decision. Uh, which decisions are being taken at the local level? Of course, this would lead to, the need, lead to capacity building at the lo local level, uh, a strengthening um, electoral governance networks. Um, so I think this is basically what I would like to, uh, to stress, um, to propose to go beyond the classic definition of electoral administration and starting from the ground mapping, uh, and making uh, a bottom-up uh, approach to uh, electoral administration. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much, Carla, for this great presentation. I'm already looking forward for some of the comments to your uh, paper. So now we continue with the next case study on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on Argentine electoral integrity. Um, please, Celeste, I'm looking forward to your presentation now. Okay, thank you. I will share the screen. Okay. Are you seeing the presentation? Okay. Yes. Well, it is a pleasure to me to share this panel with you and this great conference. Thank you so much, Toby and Holly and, and everybody. Uh, this paper that I'm presenting today, uh, I, I prepared this paper with Carolina Franco. Uh, both of us uh, work for the National Council for Scientific and Technical Research or for Argentina. And well, we, we prepare this, uh, this paper. And we, we let's start with the aims and scope of the, of the paper. So uh, during COVID-19 pandemic, government of the world has enormous uh, challenge, such as uh, learning to coexist in the new pandemic circumstances, adapting a large part of rule and procedures to the health emergency. So in this paper we are presenting today, we would like to describe the challenges that uh, Argentina face uh, to uh, to implement some measures and to uh, help elections in the context of COVID pandemic. So this paper is an attempt to contribute to understanding the effects that the extraordinary effects of the pandemic had on the electoral cycle on the Argentina integrity, uh, on the electoral integrity of Argentina. So to do that, uh, to address a change, we uh, study the 11 dimensions of the Argentina electoral cycle and uh, we yeah. uh, we use mixed methods. We made a qualitative reconstruction of the, of the stage of the 2021 electoral cycle in Argentina. For this, we made an uh, an analysis of the legal framework and the regulations. Then we did a media monitoring of the 22 electoral cycle. And then we did um, an in-depth interview with the National Electoral Director of the Ministry of the Interior. And then we did a quantitative assessment of the expert perception of the electoral cycling um, in order to conclude about the impact of the, that the pandemic has 
on the electoral integrity of Argentina. For that, we use the, the data set of the electoral integrity project. So we use the perception from electoral integrity. So um, we start with the, the, the main approach of the electoral integrity as the electoral integrity project defines that. Uh, so the electoral integrity is, is the um, conventions and the global norms applying universally to all countries worldwide throughout the electoral cycle, including the during the pre-electoral period, the campaign, the, the polling day, and its aftermath. So, well, um, after to, um, uh, before to start with the with the electoral cycling, uh, we we want to describe how was the pandemic in Argentina, how was the cases and how was the infections and how it proceeded during the year 2020 and the year 2021. So. <clears throat> Uh, the, the first case of uh, COVID uh, um, arrived on March 2020, and uh, at this moment, strong measures to restrict population mobility were implemented by the government. So the government introduced a, a strict lockdown uh, from 20 of March to 20, uh, 27 of April, and the general population could only go to shops close to their home and to provide themselves. Um, circulation throughout the city was only allowed for people having to perform essential tasks or who were except for reasons of necessity. Uh, working places remain closed, uh, moving to remote working. All educational institutions were closed and a, very, a virtual education system was established at all levels. Um, the use of a face mask in the streets at shops was mandatory as a general rule. The first wave of COVID took place between the end of May and the beginning of December of 2020. Uh, the peak of the first wave reached at a maximum of almost eight deaths per million inhabitants. And uh, thereafter, cases declined, but after the summer holidays, they again increase and new outbreak begin. Um, then we have a second uh, wave of COVID. And in March of 2021, the case begins to increase exponentially, peaking between May and Shan. And uh, the, the second wave was very intense, uh, but very short. So it lasts approximately, approximately two months. And then the vaccinations began to take effect and the case begins to decline. Uh, here I want to point, to point out that by law, the um, primary election has to be held in August. But at that time, the second wave of, uh, of COVID was still emerging from the second wave. So the elections were postponed. Now I will start to describe the electoral cycling. Okay. Yeah, uh, well, the first uh, stage that I will like to describe very, very uh, shortly is the electoral law. So we, in Argentina, we have a, by constitution, a Republican representative and federal system and the presidential system of government. So in 2021, we have only one election and was the midterm legislative, legislative election. The legislative uh, branch has two chambers, the chamber of deputies and the chamber of senators. So we, uh, in 2021, we uh, elect um, uh, one, uh, 127 deputies. And for the upper house, we um, only five provinces elect a senator and uh, were elected 24 senators. So 
uh, we we have in uh, in the country uh, the candidate selection mechanism is a system of open simultaneously and mandatory primary um, voting for both the primary and for the general election is mandatory and the primary uh, is held two months before the general election each political party presents one or more candidates and the voters must first select the party for which they want to vote because the primaries of all parties are held simultaneously so the same day and the same concept uh, so it is only possible to participate in one and then within this party choose the pre-candidate they prefer for each uh, category so uh, the electoral procedure procedures are a closed list voting system with party lists printed onto paper ballots that are inserted in an envelope and this is closed and deposit deposited in a, in a ballot box. Um, voters cannot alter the proposed list of candidates or the, or the order. And it was one, it once the polling station has closed, officials and party supervisors count the vote and record that in a signed certificate. And the certificate is transmitted by Telegram to the central computer uh, center. Yeah, okay. Um, the, elect the electoral management bodies have uh, four uh, parts, many parts. One is the electoral court that ensuring free and fair elections. The second is the official main service that are in charge of logistic of list elections. Um, then uh, we have the Ministry of Defense that guaranteeing security on election day and providing safe custody of the ballot boxes. And then the National Electoral Direct Directorate coordinates us across all the EMD parts. Okay, the first uh, thing that we uh, we have faced as a country uh, during the pandemic uh, of COVID-19 um, was the electoral calendar. So the, during the first month of 2021, when the national government has to propose the election state, Argentina was going through its second wave of COVID and had a high number of cases. So the vaccination was progressing very slowly. So for this reason, the government sent the Congress a deal to postpone the electoral calendar by five weeks with the prior agreement of opposition party leaders. The postponement was approved by the large majority. So at the time of primary election and the general election, a high percentage of residents was vaccinated and the number of daily new cases of COVID was low. So, um, another interesting thing was uh, the space and the place in where all the um, political parties um, generate consensus and agree all the adjustments have to do uh, regarding the elections uh, in the context of COVID. So the risk management framework of, for the election was composed for two essential parts. In one, uh, in the first uh, element was the extraordinary agreement issued by the National Electoral Chamber, the National Electoral Court, that um, create a program to evaluate the possible impact of the COVID-19 pandemic in the general process of the year 2021, and propose uh, the creation of the working, a working group uh, integrate by for the um, electoral management body. And then the monetary council for the primary and general election that was created in uh, by law in an act <clears throat> and, and the council was managed by the, um, um, by the dean and by the directorate of the uh, national election uh, of the Interior Ministry with representatives for the National Political Party. So, um, 
in, in 2021, the Council act as the channel throughout which uh, the, this direction was able to reach agreement with all political parties on necessary adjustments to make in the pandemic context. Uh, so in this sense, the Monetary Council, this became a source of permanent consultation and bargaining with political parties to, in order to agree the sanitary protocol to be followed in the election. Okay. Um, regarding the voting registration, okay. um, well, at the at, at, in the first moment, the possibility was implementing postal voting, internet voting, or early voting was discussed, but the Ministry of Interior decided not to make um, very big changes in the regular voting procedures, because in Argentina, we never implement postal voting, internet voting, or early voting. So for, for this reason, um, they prefer to, to keep people confident in elections and at, at, at this moment he didn't make very big changes in the voting procedure. Uh, there were also several discussions around hypothetical situations such as the possibility that people with symptoms or were or that were COVID positive should show up to vote. And this generates a very, very broad discussion, not only in the field of, of, art, of, of course, but also within society. Uh, at the final point, the um, National Electoral uh, Court provides that chat with electoral competence in each of the 20, uh, 24 districts will determine the procedure of issuing the vote for those voters who exhibit obvious symptoms compatible with COVID and who require the exercise their vote, the, the right to vote, preserving the health of other people. In event people who test COVID for, uh, for COVID, test positive for COVID-19 uh, uh, or were close contact of positive cases, were advised not to go to vote and they were required to fill an online form throughout the registry website to excuse themselves from voting. In practice, this works just as an advice. Okay, the 15 minutes are over. Um, it would be great if you could come to your conclusion soon. Okay, okay. So then the a a health protocol was um, defined as uh, with agreement with all political parties and uh, some training and education was implemented by the um, a directorate of electoral the national elections. So uh, this was implemented previously to the, the, the election day. So I will move now to the perception of the electoral integrity to, to, to close the presentation. Caro, are you here? Yes, can I be heard? Okay. Um, okay, uh, just briefly, first, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I will just briefly mention that we took a, a quantitative graphs of the undescriptive graphs of these elections, like these last elections, compared to previous Argentine elections since the, that were took place every two years since 2013 from this perception, according to the data we had in this perceptions of electoral, electoral integrity data set. And we could observe that in most of dimensions of electoral integrity, we had high values of uh, perception uh, and to, I, maybe we can see the next, slide Celeste, so I can be we can see a really slight decline for the last elections but what this was not deep and it it just brought the level of electoral integrity perceptions back to previous levels from a slight um, upward tendency in the last elections uh, so maybe I can just come to the conclusions in order to don't steal any more time. Uh, I could sum up three good practices that we held on our 
national elections uh, on this case. And these are like the, the research and report protocols prepared by the electoral management body, bodies, which were useful for other countries as well as are for our country. And the electoral, the special electoral agreements reached uh, for by the, this monetary council interrogated by the whole parties. Uh, and the evaluations carried uh, between the primary elections and the national elections, which helped to make uh, things a little bit better for the second time. Uh, we had also a couple of bad practices, uh, particularly some the management of queues, which caused delays during the primary elections. And this, uh, this uh, recommendation for positive people not to go to vote, which could have discouraged someone to actually go to, go to the polls, although we don't have any sp uh, specific data regarding this, this issue. And to close, we have uh, we could observe that the, there was no, we could discard that there was an effect of the pandemic on the uh, perceptions of electoral integrity according to the this data set. Okay, thank you. Uh, and I'm sorry we took a little, a couple of more minutes to conclude. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, both of you, uh, to um, also to Celeste again. It was a very rich presentation, and I think we will profit very much from this deep content that you have provided now to us. Um, so now I would uh, like to continue with the final presentation that is on electoral training and how it was impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Pavel, go forward. Yeah, yeah. thank you very much, uh, Rebecca. Good evening or good morning, or good afternoon, uh, wherever you are. Uh, I'm very glad to, to be here uh, today at, the, at um, uh, this uh, conference and uh, be part actually of uh, the uh, Electoral Integrity Project uh, and have the opportunity to present my paper. So uh, let's uh, start. Can, can you see it? No. 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 So let me try it one more time. Uh, yeah. Now it looks better. Yes, perfect. Just a second. Now we can go. Uh, sorry for this technical uh, pause. So um, yeah, uh, electoral uh, integrity and uh, and uh, uh, pandemic. So the pandemic, uh, as as we've heard uh, uh, today from uh, Toby and Carla and uh, uh, Celeste, that uh, pandemic changed uh, a lot of. Uh, on how the election management bodies uh, operate. So, but they were focusing mostly on the election day uh, campaign, uh, how, how the COVID influenced uh, this uh, important, uh, uh, well, the, well, the key processes, uh, but uh, still we, we know, and uh, uh, Celeste mentioned about the electoral cycle. So, uh, and uh, there are, uh, different processes taking place, uh, uh, which influence the uh, and have an impact on electoral integrity in general. Uh, so one of these processes, an important process, is, uh, was uh, uh, electoral training, and uh, so the the training for election officials uh, and the other stakeholders. So um, in my research, I put the question because, well, I'm, I'm a training person. What happened to electoral training during the COVID and how, uh, how uh, the COVID uh, uh, measures uh, uh, influenced uh, the electoral training? So how electoral training was adjusted uh, to the COVID circumstances, uh, if adjusted. And, uh, how this uh, impacted, uh, how this impact, uh, did, did it impact the quality of the trainings uh, and uh, what 
lessons uh, can we learn uh, uh, from uh, the changes that uh, were made, especially now when, uh, uh, well, COVID is uh, almost over and we, we well, there are still uh, some uh, news about the new cases of COVID, but uh, well, uh, as the pandemic, I think it's over. Still, we have some uh, practices left, uh, and uh, what are these practices? What are the lessons uh, related to uh, electoral uh, training? So, uh, my, my ambition uh, at the beginning was to uh, include uh, uh, more countries in the, in my uh, in my research, and I was focusing uh, uh, only on the uh, countries where the electoral training is uh, institutionalized. So meaning that uh, there are training centers or training academies uh, well, uh, or uh, some other uh, well, training facilities uh, which provide the institutionalized uh, uh, training to election officials and other stakeholders. Uh, but the, to make the first steps, uh, and uh, this is what I'm going to, to present uh, in uh, uh, my presentation today. Uh, so. Um, I focused on uh, the Center for uh, uh, Continuous Electoral Training in Moldova. Uh, well, well, first of all, because uh, I was part of it, I was head of the center just uh, uh, two months before the COVID started. Uh, but also because uh, the, the practice uh, and the change that they have, uh, it's interesting to study and to see, uh, well, how it happened and what were the solutions and what be the, the lessons uh, learned. So um, what, what happened and, and how the, the COVID uh, impacted uh, electoral training uh, in uh, Moldova. So just to remember that the pandemic uh, started, uh, well, was announced, officially announced, uh, COVID announced the pandemic in March and Moldova had to conduct elections, uh, presidential elections uh, at the uh, national level uh, on the 1st of November. And uh, at that time, for all election officials around the world, uh, or election workers, uh, how uh, Carla would say, uh, so uh, all the election workers around the world were asking each other, oh, how do we do it, actually? What, what are the new rules? Uh, and of course, most uh, people were thinking about uh, uh, well, the election day, how people will participate and how they will come to the polling station. But the, uh, those who were responsible for electoral training, uh, uh, so they were thinking about how to train these thousand of people uh, because, uh, well, the, uh, it was the first um, uh, first threat uh, to uh, uh, for for the uh, election officials. Uh, well, if they get uh, infected or uh, uh, before election day during the training, so it will influence uh, by the by the end uh, of the day the. A result in integrity of uh, election. So the the uh, training uh, uh, training officials, the, those who are providing the training, they were the, the first to think about uh, well, what, how to actually uh, organize this uh, uh, electoral uh, process. So, what were the modifications, main modifications in uh, Moldova? Of course, well, uh, usage of uh, personal protection equipment. So the, uh, the tra training officials were the, the first, at least in Moldova, uh, who started to use this equipment, uh, well, the masks uh, and sanitizers and uh, um, also uh, these uh, measures uh, and requirements of social distance uh, and uh, holding actually uh, the training in a, in a bigger room. So on the picture, you see the room which is not really uh, good for uh, uh, for the modern type or uh, interactive training, uh, but still uh, chosen because of the bigger space uh, and uh, uh, possibility to you know to ensure the uh, physical distance between the uh, participants. Uh, of course, well, uh, not all the uh, regions or not all the localities had such kind of. Uh, uh, spaces and it uh, of course influenced the ability uh, of the uh, training uh, 
officials who actually organize the training in one or another uh, locality. Uh, also, uh, well, the usage uh, uh, of this uh, uh, PPE, the so personal protection equipment, uh, was one of the measure actually to encourage uh, uh, future election officials or uh, well, the, those uh, who already been uh, nominated uh, to actually participate in because there was a, a fear uh, to come to the training uh, or to, to come uh, again uh, to uh, uh, to some uh, to, to participate in activity where you can uh, potentially uh, get uh, infected. Uh, so and it also used the and the participation of the training, which um, uh, also the uh, could affect the professionalism of uh, election staff. Uh, and besides that, so the, this uh, uh, safety requirements also influence the methodology of the training, so which became uh, less uh, interactive and uh, as a result, uh, more superficial uh, and uh, affected the, could affect the professionalism of uh, election staff. So the solution to what, what was the solution to it was, uh, of course, the remote uh, uh, remote training. So what uh, the um, what has been done. Uh, what has been done uh, uh, by the uh, training center in Moldova. So uh, uh, first of all, uh, there were uh, some steps taken even before, uh, before COVID. Uh, Moldovan training center had uh, an e-learning platform with uh, more than uh, 13 uh, courses on, on the uh, platform for election officials, but not only. Um, then uh, also in the strategic plan that was uh, adopted or drafted and adopted uh, by the end of uh, uh, 2019, uh, there was one of the strategic objectives of the center was the digitalization of uh, electoral training. So uh, somehow mentally uh, and also by uh, in the uh, year plan based on the strategic plan of the center, they had these uh, uh, activities related to digitalization of the training. Um, but still, uh, well, uh, there were just plans, but uh, the COVID uh, required quick, uh, uh, quick steps taken and uh, uh, the, the training programs uh, uh, modified. So uh, uh, the, well, the personnel of the training center had to look for new platforms uh, uh, where to provide more interactive training because the e-learning platform didn't have this, uh, uh, this uh, ability to provide uh, interactive trainings, only pre-recorded one. So they, uh, they explored Zoom, they have to learn how to use Zoom, how to use breakout room, uh, how to use uh, other interactive uh, platforms to ensure uh, the level of interactiv interactivity that uh, uh, training center had uh, uh, for the face-to-face -face training. Uh, there were also uh, mm, uh, so-called conferences or YouTube uh, live streams, which were used uh, to train uh, a bigger number of uh, election uh, workers uh, around the country. And these uh, YouTube live streams would go together with uh, uh, with the face to face trainings. So, and in this case, uh, so center would uh, cover uh, those uh, those uh, uh, issues that uh, that uh, had uh, face to face training, and also uh, those shortcomings that uh, were. Uh, well, evident during the remote training. So just to conclude, uh, there was an increase, you, you can see from uh, approximately 1% to 40% of uh, online uh, uh, training. Um, and uh, 
well, the training center started uh, to use uh, uh, as, as a, uh, one of the uh, key modes of, uh, of the of modalities of the training, uh, blended training. So the mixture of uh, remote and uh, and uh, face to face. So this is the main question, the main uh, lesson that uh, the training center learned. And uh, now, if we compare it to the times uh, before COVID, when the face to face uh, training was the main modality of training, now uh, it would probably be uh, blended training. And just to add uh, uh, another experience, which well, will be, uh, I will continue uh, working on uh, on this topic. But uh, just few insights from uh, the colleagues in Ukraine uh, who switched actually from uh, one uh, two percent uh, of, of the training provided online to one hundred, so ninety nine percent. Almost all the trainings during the COVID time were provided. Uh, uh, 99%. And as Toby mentioned that, uh, okay, COVID is, uh, is over, but there uh, are uh, other disasters and, and so on. So now in Ukraine, they have a war, uh, but uh, election commission is still working and, uh, and uh, training center is working and providing uh, some of the trainings online using this experience uh, uh, of COVID and uh, because of the war being unable uh, to move around the country, but still having uh, uh, well internet connection and uh, uh, well access of uh, of uh, well the main population to to internet, so they can uh, provide the training and continue working uh, uh, on elections. Thank you very much. I'm ready to answer your question.